This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. My name is Charlie Kolstad. I'm a faculty member here in the Bren School. Um, welcome to the spring quarter public lecture of the Zurich Financial Services uh, Distinguished Visitor in Climate. Uh, several years ago, Zurich generously endowed a lecture series uh, here at the Bren School, which allows us every quarter to bring to campus a world-renowned scholar or practitioner uh, in some aspect of climate change. Uh, this gift is not just for uh, presentation, but for a deeper visit over a week or two with multiple opportunities to interact with the Bren community. We are grateful to Zurich for this far-sighted program, which leads me to introduce uh, Ben Harper. Oh. So you didn't hear anything I said just before. Ben Harper, who after, after uh, playing a tune for us, will uh, uh, present the speaker. Um, as a climate product officer at Zurich Financial Services, Mr. Harper is responsible for evaluating uh, climate risks and developing climate-related insurance products, including coverages for renewable energy, greenhouse gas emissions, and geologic sequestration. Mr. R. Harper co-authored both the Zurich CCS, that's Carbon Capture and Storage, uh, liability policy and accompanying geologic sequestration financial assurance policy. And those of you who know carbon capture and storage know how uh, much of an achievement that must have been because of the great deal of, of uncertainty and risk associated with that. Mr. Harper has over 20 years of experience in environmental engineering and construction. Prior to his current role, Mr. Harper managed Zurich's environmental risk engineering group which is responsible for determining and quantifying environmental risks in support of underwriting environmental uh, coverage insurance products. And Mr. Harper has developed large insurance programs for multiple circular sites, that's Superfund sites. As a consultant, Mr. Harper served as project manager on several large environmental disaster cleanups, including the largest chemical spill ever recorded in the eastern United States. Uh, Mr. Harper is a certified cost engineer certified by the Association of Advancement of Cost Engineering, and holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering. Please join me in welcoming Ben Harper. As a specialty insurer, we're in the business of taking unique risks, and that includes uh, environmental and climate change risks. Um, our relationship with the Bren School, uh, be it through the Distinguished Visitors Program, through the internships, and through specialty research, has, uh, has really been critical to Zurich, enabling us to provide uh, needed insurance products to the marketplace while maintaining financial, scientific, and regulatory discipline. Um, we find the Bren School curriculum to be unique in that it combines science with business, and that aligns very well with Zurich's current business model. So we look forward to today's presentation and to the continued partnership we have with the school. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Toman, whom I've known for many years. Mike is a, a, a widely known economist who's worked extensively on problems of climate change, particularly in the developing world. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Rochester and is a, a, a professorial lecturer in the Nitsi School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins in Washington, as well as an adjunct faculty member of the Brent School. He also works on climate economics in a major international 
development institution, which I will tell you is the World Bank. Um, prior to moving to the bank, he served as director of the RAND Corporation's Environment and Energy Programs. Uh, previous appointments included include a senior economist at the S Sustainable Development Department of the Inter-American Development Bank, that's a mouthful, and senior fellow and division director at Resources for the Future. Uh, he does research on a variety of topics concerned with energy, the environment, climate change, and sustainable development. He has published many journal articles and monographs as well as several books. Please join me in giving Mike Toman a warm welcome back to Brand this quarter as uh, Zurich's distinguished lecturer. Some of you who have read about sustainable development will recognize perhaps that the title is a bit of a paraphrase of what was said in a UN report by the Brundtland Commission way back in 1987. Uh, Gro Harlan Brundtland was the uh, Prime Minister at that point of Norway and went on to a very distinguished career as an international civil servant in the UN. And uh, the language that was developed in that 1987 report defined sustainable development as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future to meet its needs. And while sustainable development has a lot more to it than climate change, climate change has certainly taken up a lot of the space around that topic, so it seemed appropriate to try to have a little homage to the Brundtland Report in, in my title here. I want to start with a few pictures. In fact, the only thing you're going to see on the screen is pictures. Unlike the suffering I impose on my students with pedantic overheads, uh, someday I'll have to show them the uh, PowerPoint version of the uh, Gettysburg Address, which is actually pretty funny. Today, I'll limit myself to pictures and try to just give some words of amplification. I want to start by uh, asserting that climate change is an important problem. It's not an important scientific problem alone, though it's a very important scientific problem. It's an important problem for public policy. It's an important problem for figuring out how to have global development that does, in fact, meet the needs of the present, which includes raising living standards in still a great deal of the world, billions of people that live on less than $2.25 a day of real purchasing power, and at the same time trying to deal with the problem that scientists have now, um, I think, definitively concluded is human-caused and something to be, of, uh, to be really worried about. I started here by uh, writing down or putting up this uh, somewhat aged slide, but still basically uh, correct, showing in the United States that most of our contribution is from carbon dioxide, and that's pretty much true worldwide. Uh, we get that mostly from fossil fuel burning. In other countries, it also comes from deforestation. There are other things to worry about, including uh, methane from a variety of agricultural and other sources. Uh, nitrous oxide, nitrogen oxide, I think that's really what that means to say, and some other things. But this is fundamentally a CO2 problem, and that in turn leads to one of the conclusions I'll try to develop here, which is that this is uh, as much an energy problem, if not more, than an environmental problem. So that will be one of the key themes I want to try to develop as we go forward here. Now these are pictures taken from the latest report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. This is the report, as many of you know, that has had a little bit of unfavorable coverage in the news lately. Uh, it's also the case that just recently the independent panel inspecting all of the shenanigans going on at the University of East Anglia concluded, in effect, if I paraphrase, yeah, they, they said some dumb things, but they didn't do anything wrong. And so all of the furor in the news about how this was climate gate, they've pretty much dispensed with that. Um, so, with that aside, I'm going to present IPCC results uh, as if they represent the best consensus of science because I, I truly believe they do. Now what you've got here is uh, left of the line historical emissions up to 2000 and on the right you have these various colors and bands around them. These reflect the fact that we have uncertainty about how the future will develop, population growth, energy technology, energy intensity in the economy and so forth. And that's represented by these different colors that represent different scenarios looking ahead. Uh, 
And we have also this sort of uh, yellowish color that says what would happen if we could freeze the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at 2,000 levels, a practical impossibility, but an interesting reference point. And what you see on the left-hand axis is that excluding that practical impossibility, we're talking about warming relative to 2,000 on the order of 1.5 to 3.5 degrees centigrade by 2100, with a band that could go higher up to 4 degrees centigrade, uh, and business as usual going you know, much higher than that. So if we don't do anything, we're going to see an unprecedented level of temperature change, and that's going to, in turn, put into motion an unprecedented set of changes in the, the global natural system. So basically what we're talking about is on the order of 60 centimeters of sea level rise as a kind of a central tendency, and that could be a lot larger than that, and indeed somewhat lower than that. So if you uh, overlay half a meter of sea level rise on Bangladesh, you realize the scale of the problem. Now, they have a century or even longer to adjust, so it's not like they'll all just stay there and, and float away, but the scale of the adjustment problem, whether it's to try to protect that land, move people to different places, or in some other way address it, uh, it that's illustrative of the kinds of things that we might be dealing with. This slightly busy slide, you don't need to look at any of the detailed words that you couldn't see from a distance. But the thing to uh, capture is that the further toward 5 degrees centigrade on the right-hand side we go, the darker these colors get, and that represents increasing risk. Uh, at one level, we may be finding, for example, uh, small amounts of damage to corals and some specific wildlife problems with as much as one degree of warming. We could have, at the upper end, significant global extinctions uh, with fundamental implications for both biodiversity and the way that natural systems work in general. Uh, food supply, pretty uh, modest effects for small temperature change, pretty significant effects with large temperature change, even after you adjust for what will be significant capacities for adaptation within um, individual parts of the global food uh, and fiber market. Coastal areas, inundation, greater risks of storm surges. Now, all of these are uncertain. The size of these effects are substantially uncertain. And so we do need to be careful when, as social scientists or people involved in the policy debate, we argue that this is a risk that we know is going to be catastrophic within X years, because we don't know that. We know that there could be catastrophic risks, and those are very unlikely. They'll get more likely the more the concentration of greenhouse gases is. And we know that while it's hard to call the timing or the magnitude of the risks, there's a fair degree of confidence that if we go past, say, 2 degrees centigrade of further warming, the risks are going to start to move into a zone that's not very comfortable from a risk management point of view. It starts to look at least yellow on the risk scale, maybe shading into orange. And as we get into 4 or 5 degrees, we're moving into the orange and red zones. Now, a few slides just to give background. I apologize for the slight degree of uh, fuzziness on these. Um, this gives a picture of the other side of the story. Where are we going with respect to that principal factor that is driving the accumulation of greenhouse gases and all the consequences? These are figures from the Energy Information Administration, that uh, part of the Energy Department in the US, that uh, project what will be happening to uh, energy use we're measuring this in a standardized unit of quadrillion BTU. I'm sure we could measure this in petajoules too, but for some reason we seem to love continuing to have English measurements here. So you see that we're moving from in uh, 2000, or 2006 better, 472 quads up to 678 quads in 2030, and that's just 2030. Beyond that we'd see continuing increase. You can see that the red part on the bottom is just two countries, China and India. So the, the growth juggernaut that China is and the growth juggernaut that India is likely to be are represented here by very, very substantial growth in their energy consumption. And the green part, the rest of the world other than the United States, is growing pretty substantially as well. If I put up another figure that showed OECD and non-OECD, 
you'd see similarly that there's basically no energy growth projection, very modest in the OECD. And all this growth is where essentially 75, 80% of the population is going to be living and already the predominant location of people, namely the middle and low income countries in the developing world. This is uh, essentially the same figure, but interestingly broken down by fuels. This is important because coal is the most carbon intensive of our fuel, fossil fuels, uh, natural gas much less so, renewables if grown correctly, very little net carbon intensity, nuclear also very modest carbon intensity, but also as you can see here, very modest expected growth. Some people are now discussing that and saying, well, there could be a lot more growth in nuclear. I think the jury's still out on that. But that's a whole separate conversation. So what you see here is that while in absolute terms, the low carbon resources are projected to grow, they're not really projected to grow in anything like the magnitude needed to move toward a low carbon energy future, at least not by 2030. Now against that, the IPCC will say that if we don't start to have emissions really stabilizing at a global level and turning down by somewhere around 2030 to 2040, depending on you know, how much risk you want to take, we're going to be really going into that orange zone. So when you see by 2030 that we're having all this growth in fossil energy, and um, that's already taking us well into the time when we need to be decarbonizing, there's a sort of an irresistible force and a movable object problem here. One more picture of this nature, basically just showing the same thing. Uh, liquid energy is very unimportant for uh, producing electricity in most countries. Coal is very important and basically grows, as does some natural gas. Modest growth in the low carbon options in, um, in contrast. Now against that, I mentioned that we have to be meeting the needs of the present. So if we focus only on those charts that indicate the, the sort of potential train wreck from emissions and climate change, we miss another important picture, which is that the uh, lightest colored areas in this map are areas where under 33% of the population has access to electricity, period. Not electricity three hours a day, period. So you see most of Sub-Saharan Africa has no access to electricity. This, you know, d d electricity delivered other than through batteries, which are a pretty expensive way to get energy. Uh, most of Latin America has uh, access that is, this is actually a typo on the slide, greater than two-thirds. But even here, this masks a lot of difference between urban and rural populations. Uh, in rural areas in Africa, access can be under 15%, and in cities, a bit higher. So we have a billion and a half people that don't really have routine access to electricity. And it's, I think, pretty hard for most of us to even imagine what life must be like in those places. But basically, the message is, you don't have simple lighting services to be able to work at night or go to school uh, to manage a second business after working in your fields. You don't have, even within the village, access to basic refrigeration for medicines. Uh, you don't get to watch the World Cup, which may seem frivolous, but we take for granted these kind of quality of life things, and these are non-existent for these people, or at least very expensive to provide. And uh, while this is about electricity, there's an equally severe problem related to very dirty cooking fuels that are used and the horrific problems for the health of women and children that that poses from the inhalation of all the smoke. Uh, this slide simply shows what you probably know intuitively, that energy consumption does grow uh, from a correlation point of view, uh, the vertical axis, as income per capita grows, though not at an increasing rate. It tends to flatten out after a while when an economy is fully developed. But what this indicates is that if our strategy for climate change were to try to preclude growth in global energy consumption, that simply wouldn't fly. So we have to make room in the, for the growth in energy use in the developing world to achieve basic or beyond basic quality of life and we have to figure out how to reduce global emissions. So the conclusion that I draw from that is we basically need to start over, you know, have a, have a, have a reset in our energy program. Without radical decarbonization of energy, we simply can't achieve the meeting of the present needs without compromising the future's ability to meet its needs. That's why I say this is as much or more an energy problem than it is a climate problem, though the effects are certainly 
uh, climate and, and environmental in their nature. Uh, this and the next picture simply show where the emissions are coming from. Annex 1 means the industrial countries. They have 20% of the population, but if you add up the heights of all those bar charts, they have the vast uh, proportion of global emissions. This is measured uh, in terms of uh, population. Now, this measures the energy intensity. We tend to have lower energy intensity in more advanced industrial countries. The right-hand bar uh, tends to uh, be mostly Europe. Uh, the U.S. is in that blue bar in the middle. We're somewhat more energy intensive. And um, the former Soviet Union is over more to the left because they have the legacy of very coal-intensive power production and fairly inefficient power plants. So economic modernization can lead to lower CO2 intensity per dollar of GDP. That's the uh, mirror image of the other picture I showed for how income growth tends to also flatten out energy use. But the scale of energy use grows so fast with wealth that were we to just keep the current energy mix or even have improvements in the current mix with incremental introduction of renewables and improvement in energy efficiency for which technologists at least will say we've got a lot of room to improve, all of those good practices won't be enough. We've got to move beyond the existing set of relatively affordable good practices into a terrain that is beyond what we've really dealt with in the energy system up until now. Now, why don't we just go about doing it? Why, if this is such a big problem, do we not just jump in? Yes, we know these technologies are a little expensive, but here in California we have the uh, program for reducing, stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions, AB32. We have various uh, performance standards for reducing CO2 intensity of vehicle fuels for moving toward uh, low carbon generation of power. Well, if California can do it, why can't we do it all through the developed world and then get it to spread in a virtuous way to the developing world? The answer is not primarily because it's not possible, technically. It's primarily because it's expensive. And this is not something that's so obvious when you look at simple statistics like 30% of Denmark's electricity comes from wind. You notice this when you see how it is that they get 30% of their electricity from wind. They basically take that high-cost wind and average its cost with low-cost other sources of generation. And when you average out, like we used to do way back when in setting electric utility rates, the average cost isn't so bad. But if we had a more competitive power market and we could actually see the incremental costs of these renewable sources, they would never be purchased in an open market. They're only purchased when regulation insists on it, as we see with renewable portfolio standards and other policies. We get them now because they're required, not because they're economically attractive. There are niches in which wind works very well. We see those certainly here in California. Uh, South Dakota wants to create huge amounts of wind, may end up being one of their primary exports. Uh, but of course, they've got to figure out how to get it down to where more than a couple hundred thousand people live. And that's itself a, a big and costly problem. Now, when I was at RAND, we did a study of what it would take to get 25% renewables by 2025 into electricity and into fuels. And these figures, which I won't dwell on in any detail, basically show electricity, not such a big deal. It could raise average expenditures, a very rough proxy for average rates, a little bit to a third, not pleasant. It could raise expenditures from not very much if you can substitute renewables cheaply, which is easier to do in electricity, to maybe 15, 20%. In the fuel case, um, the uh, expenditures per gallon of fuel could be from a baseline figure we used of $2 wholesale, a couple of years old, to more than $6. So trying to get 25% renewable fuel, given even very optimistic assumptions about the improvement of biofuel technology, could basically triple gasoline prices. Four cents a gallon was basically all that the Clinton administration could get in 1993, and it suffered lasting harm politically from trying to get uh, a more broad-based carbon, partly carbon tax. Tripling the price per gallon will not come easy and not come cheap. Now, why do the expenditure changes 
look so negative here. It's an artifact of the way we model it because we assumed that um, you would have to tax gasoline up to that level to get people to buy the alternative fuel. And so there would be essentially a big tax windfall to the government. And this figure nets that out. So it's a great way to reduce the deficit if you could get away with imposing an excise tax like we see in Europe, which is double the wholesale price of the fuel or more. But it's not exactly a political cakewalk. Uh, one last point I think relevant to California maybe is that when you set ambitious targets, which is, uh, for some reason I lost the scale on the bottom, 25% is the, um, the right-hand bar, 20% is the middle bar, and the vertical distance is expenditures. So you can see just by backing off your uh, goal a little bit, you can often reduce costs a lot. And that's because given current technology, we keep running into these these capacity constraints. We just can't grow enough biomass right now to meet all the demands for it in power and fuels. Uh, in 20 years, we will be able to do better. Will we be able to do better enough? Nobody's really sure, but there do seem to be reasons to doubt that. In 40 years, 50, can we do more? Certainly much more likely, but that implies that we really need to take our time with this. We need to not consider this just a leap in and then look strategy. Ready, fire, aim is not a good idea here if we want to have sustainable policy as well as a sustainable environment because these things will simply um, uh, evaporate in terms of all political support if we try to do the impossible. Now, let me come back to that. I'll, I'll leave this one up for a minute and move on to some other subjects. So I've tried to make the case here that we do need to address climate change. We have to do that by dramatic reductions in emissions ultimately and perhaps sooner than later. We can't simply go out and uh, do this, you know, just do it now given the realities of the economics of uh, low carbon energy. I didn't do anything here with, with nuclear, but nuclear is probably cheaper now than it was 25 years ago. It's still no bargain and will continue to be a very hotly debated possibility for a lot of reasons. So we have this conundrum. We have to take action, but it's costly to take action. And when you think about the fact that right now we have in the international architecture of agreement for reducing emissions, this kind of odd approach, this hybrid in which rich countries ostensibly are going to keep meeting stricter and stricter targets for reducing their emissions, how enforceable those are is another question. And developing countries someday will have to do something, but we don't have any clear idea of what that might be. And many of them, for very understandable reasons, absolutely reject the idea of reducing their emissions, at least until their per capita incomes are much higher. That makes the idea of trying to uh, coordinate and implement a drastic emission reduction uh, policy or a coordinated set of policies all the more problematic in my view. We certainly want to give people incentives to reduce emissions, but if we simply tried to do that by taxing fossil fuel, the kind of things that we would need to do economically to get these changes to happen, I think basically defy political reality. So this is not just an energy problem, it's an energy and technology problem. I'll say in a moment um, that we do need to use the tools that economists have developed. We need to use them much more actively and aggressively than we've been able to do to date. And we need to try to spread the use of those tools beyond the OECD rich country uh, club of energy users. But that's not going to be enough. So where does that leave us? Well, engineers and technologists could be more precise on this point than I can be, but I can certainly make an intuitive argument that I think is robust. We need to do a lot more on the R&D front. Uh, that's an easy thing to say, and it's, it's, it's sort of a, a banal truism. So what does that really mean? Well, one thing is we need to spend more money, but we also need to spend money in a more intelligent way. So I pulled a few uh, figures off of the National Science Foundation website, which just gives basic background on what's going on with research uh, and development spending in the United States. And so I'll quickly run through those here. Uh, looking over roughly 40 years with inflation-adjusted dollars, um, you see that basically business and other, and it's mostly business, the rest is nonprofits and you know, a very small share, 
business expenditure has grown a lot while government expenditure has grown only a little. Is that a problem? Well, the basic research part is basically uh, the government's spending or university and other research center spending. Now, the university figure does not include grants from government. This is basically what you know, taxpayers spend or what universities spend from you know, generous endowments to do research on campus. And the government figure of 15 includes both national labs and grants to research centers. So business is not doing very much of the basic research. They're doing mostly applied research. And if we need breakthroughs, a admittedly overused term, in the energy area, the current setup here leaves some question about whether we can achieve that. Um, we have had um, an R&D growth rate over the last 20 years, 10 years, and five years, somewhat larger than the real growth rate of national income, but not hugely larger. And this may not be a problem that we could solve simply by tripling the relative growth rate of R&D to GDP, because it's much easier to increase budgets than it is to spend them wisely, something which, unfortunately, some years of living in Washington has given me a lot of experience to see firsthand. This gives a picture of how the budget for public R&D has been divided over roughly 30 years. Um, defense has always been a big share, and it's actually grown since the late 70s. Energy was a big share in the late 70s. This is the Carter administration, uh, energy crisis from that time with oil price shocks. And you can see by 10 years later, that had basically dropped uh, dramatically and dropped even further during the 90s. And up until 2008, hadn't recovered. Now, the Obama administration's moving in the other direction, and you would see some improvement in these figures probably for 09. But the basic trend is pretty clear. We have not done anything in 30 years to really deal with energy like it is a crisis, whether it's availability, cost, national security, or uh, environment and climate change. We've moved exactly in the opposite direction in terms of R&D funding. Business has done a lot of expenditure. Business has been enormously creative in figuring out how to use modern technology for uh, geophysical imaging and uh, directional drilling in the oil sector to use very high-tech, IT-intensive approaches to find smaller and smaller patches of oil uh, or uh, small pockets of natural gas. So we've gotten very good at producing energy. What we aren't very good at yet is bringing new kinds of energy online because we just don't have the basic technology down yet. Uh, well, that's premature, sorry. Um, <laughs> so we need to spend money, but we need to spend it wisely. And this is actually a subject that I think gets under-researched, and I don't have an answer to propose today. I do know that we need to do more experimentation with competitive allocations that try to be more results-oriented in the applied phase of R&D. Uh, this is something that was tried, I think, once in California, where research money for applied technology was allocated based on a competitive bidding process. Bidders, who were the technology developers, said, give me X dollars and I'll supply Y refrigerators, each of which saves Z percent in energy. And basically, you could allocate this pot of subsidy money based on promised performance. And of course, nobody got the money until after the refrigerators were in those homes and businesses working. So in the applied area, there's room for this kind of thing, but a much harder nut to crack, as the National Research Council has shown several times, how do you really organize a competitive yet properly scaled basic energy R&D program? I don't think we have the answer to that. We can say that programs that continue to do a lot of legacy funding, whether it be cleaning up nuclear waste sites, certainly not a trivial concern, or the funding of um, clean coal technology, valuable in being able to use existing coal reserves uh, more intelligently. All good things, but if they basically take up most of the budget space, or a lot of it, we're not dealing with the problem. So we are going to have to increase money, and we're going to have to find ways to particularly have these new technology development efforts not simply turn into a kind of pork barrel where we're defending different budgets based on the congressional district in which a national lab or a big university research center might be located. You know, merit's tough, but it's still not a bad thing when it comes to this. Now, that's 
as you could see, all I have for the pictures, but I do want to say now to kind of wind up, a few words on the policy side. Uh, it's a little strange as an economist to have spent so much time talking about technology and, and technology spending, so I want to re-earn my bona fides with a little word about um, the economic side of this. Most, if not all, of you know that we've been engaged in a debate in the United States now for uh, more than 15 years on how we would regulate our CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions. Last year, we got as far as we've ever gotten in the political process, having both the House and the Senate pass different versions of bills to regulate CO2 and other gases. Both processes in both houses involved a lot of what is you know, euphemistically termed sausage making. Lots of deals were cut, lots of compromises were made, lots of last minute things were done to try to placate different members with different constituencies. We did get legislation. Is this a good thing? Well, that can be interpreted a couple of ways. It could be seen as a good thing compared to not having anything. That's an argument frequently made from those who have been in the trenches all these years and who don't want perfection to be the enemy of the good, very reasonable. You could also say, though, that what we've ended up with is such a Frankenstein of policies that it may actually not be very effective. We may have worked really hard in the policy laboratory and, and build an Edsel rather than a Porsche. And okay, we don't need a Porsche, but could we at least get you know, a halfway decent Pontiac out of the deal? Oh, actually, that's, isn't GM discontinuing that brand? <laughs> Sorry. Um, what we have in these bills is an attempt to use an economic incentive mechanism that people in our field uh, have written about for a long time, and we've used very successfully in the acid rain program, a cap and trade program, trying to create prices for emissions through making the uh, opportunity to emit a tradable good. It gets a price, people try to minimize their costs of compliance, that price also creates lots of good incentives for new technology to develop. It creates a mechanism an economic mechanism to pull in new technology. Now, I don't think, as I've said, that's enough. We need the R&D funding. We may need some large-scale implementation programs in some sectors to get new technology in without the long delays that the infrastructure inertia would, would cause. But it's a, good, it's a good idea, a good idea to use this kind of policy. But is it a good idea It's actually written into the legislation? That's much less clear to me. Basically, as the bills have come out, they've, in, they've included what's called a price collar, meaning that the price of these emissions, allowances, uh, can't go above a certain level, can't go below a certain level. And each, uh, each of those restrictions satisfies a different constituency, as you can imagine. Business likes the cap on the price. Environmentalists like the floor because they don't want efforts to reduce emissions and change technology to basically go through the floor and, and, and be dissipated. Uh, there are a lot of exceptions. There are a lot of abilities to use what are called offsets, where you can do projects outside the main scope, having more carbon stay behind in agricultural fields and the roots by changing some uh, methods of cultivation. These are inherently much harder to monitor. They're also very remunerative for the agriculture sector, which has you know, continued to demonstrate its prowess in uh, gaining advantage out of legislation that can increase payments to, to farmers or to the, the middlemen. So what we have is a good idea that's been surrounded by a lot of kind of rusted metal and squeaky brakes and wheels. It's not obvious that this is going to work very well, and it may not work very well at all. Uh, we saw in the European market for emissions trading a great deal of price volatility. Now, the US program wouldn't be subject to the same problems, but it's still just a cautionary point about how difficult this can be. So some economists, and I would count myself in this group, have said we need to kind of go back to basics. We need to go back to that old time religion. We need to do what the economist A.C. Pigou was talking about in the 1920s when he said, let's tax the bads. People have analyzed carbon taxes for a long, long time. They always are uh, stopped short by saying, well, you can't do this politically. It's the third rail of American energy politics. Well. Now I think it's a somewhat different game because we also have an enormous budget deficit that people are worrying about. They're throwing tea bags about it. Uh, we have uh, reason to think that what we've got now may actually kind of cough and die a few yards off the uh, starting line. 
And we have people becoming more concerned about climate change, though not necessarily more concerned to spend a ton of money. So why don't we start with a small carbon tax based on the carbon content of different fuels. You can tax emissions where you can measure them, tax fuels where you can't measure emissions. It's easy to figure out the carbon content of a gallon of fuel. And then um, move forward with that gradually. The point is to give a real solid signal that that tax isn't going to go down. It's going to go up. You don't even have to say exactly how rapidly, but if you build in long-term expectations that we're going to be moving in a direction of greater and greater cost for emissions, that will be a very catalyzing force for both public managers of R&D and private uh, and agents that need to think about how the next power plant is going to be built. So let's strip away all the complications and go back to a very basic policy and then use the money in smart ways. Deficit reduction, rebates to households, some funding for R&D, some funding for displaced workers in the coal fields who are going to be likely bearing the biggest brunt of this along with a few other affected industries. There's a way to build a constituency around this through money that is much less clumsy than the way we've tried to build a constituency around these trading programs. So that would be my, my two-minute recommendation on the uh, domestic policy side and my one-minute last comment on the international side. We are continuing now 12, 13 years after the Kyoto Treaty was agreed to, uh, the first big effort to try to get targets and timetables for reducing national emissions. We're continuing to argue about what will happen after that expires in 2012 and how we're going to get big countries like India and China into that system. It may be, despite the conceptual advantages of this approach where you can trade emissions between countries as well as within, that this just isn't going to work. We may need to be thinking about something that looks more like cooperating for the good rather than cooperating for sharing the burden of a bad. That could be done, for example, by cooperation to achieve common performance standards in the power sector. Rich countries com uh, commit to having no more than X grams of carbon per kilowatt hour of electricity, and developing countries say within X years will achieve the same standard. Now, cooperation around technology is much less cost effective than cooperation around prices. But it may actually work, and that may be something we at least need to think about, because this is an area where we do risk having perfection be the enemy of the good. And if we don't get everybody on board, it really doesn't matter what we do to our emissions. If we don't get the world's emissions down, we can be carbon free and, and we'll still have those big temperature increases. In your view, what is the main message of that, uh, of that work? Well, the mantra that's been used to describe it by the directors of it and many others involved is that we need to act now, we need to act flexibly, and we need to um, act cooperatively. So acting now is consistent with my point that we need to get going, though they embrace a much more stringent act now kind of approach, which is similar to what the EU has advocated, trying to reach a very, very low incremental temperature change that many in the economics world would question the ability to, to do it, frankly. Uh, acting uh, smart means using market mechanisms as well as adapting in a forward-looking way. That's not anything to argue about. And doing it cooperatively basically involves trying to get developed countries to do more now, but also to do more through these international cooperation mechanisms that trade money for carbon allowances, the things we've already got in the Kyoto Treaty. That's, I think, continues to be a good idea. Whether it's going to be good enough to get developing countries involved is, I think, an open question. So that's the mantra. Let's get going on this, and then the, the devil's in the details, I'd say. Yeah. Great. Uh, it seems as though with the economic uh, downturn we've had and the, the term limit process of the political field, we're focusing more and more on our belly buttons when it comes to looking at short-term costs as opposed to long-term costs. And, and it's evident in the way the Congress is, is, is working right now. What kind of, what sources of optimism do you have that we can actually make progress when we're all out 
for ourselves, mm -hmm. or it's, at least it seems that way, particularly in the, in the role of energy and, uh, and a carbon tax? Great question. I think that the package that I've suggested for domestic policy has advantages in that respect. Uh, we're not trying to get draconian changes right away. Yes, we're using the T word, and we, that means we can't have a very big tax now, but we have a climate in which we might get a little farther with that. And the core here is being able to move forward on the technology front. Even if we didn't get very far on, on a carbon tax or some other policy, the more we advance on the technology part, the more it is in people's self-interest, and even with our you know, business or government myopia, it becomes more of a no-brainer. So your point is well taken, but I think moving the technology front forward with some moderate and, and calibrated economic tools that can also help on the deficit side, I think is at least worth trying. Mike, thanks, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I want to talk about or ask a question about the inter your last comment mm -hmm. about sort of international cooperation. Mm -hmm. if, if the international community can't organize around markets, what makes you think they can organize around technology or that you know, the leaders will in fact be followed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I guess I can't answer that obviously with confidence, but I have, I think, a little more confidence in at least trying it. And the argument would be something like this. Many developing countries, both higher and lower income within that group, know that they're going to be modernizing large portions of their capital stock anyway as they grow. So we're not saying to them, you can't do something. We're saying, you're going to be doing something anyway. So let's see if we can work this in a way that, yes, it might be a little costlier for you, but you can embed it in your overall development program. And international assistance, whether it's you know, low interest World Bank loans or income transfers from wealthy countries, can be focused on trying to get that cost increment covered without it being wrapped up in a trade of carbon allowances for money that may not be properly monitored anyway. So it's not a slam dunk, but my hope is that by moving the psychology of it into doing good with them already wanting to move generally in these positive directions, that would be part of what would make the deal work. We know that in a lot of industries, the new capital stock in developing countries isn't inferior to what it is in developed countries. There's been a lot of research on that that says it's not that uh, we make paper in an inherently inefficient way in Indonesia relative to how we might make it in, in Europe. So there is a certain degree of technological homogeneity, not so much in power, and that's why that would be the big area to focus on. It's a big source of emissions anyway. But I think because they've got such huge screaming demands for increased electricity, and we know there's going to be a trillion a year spent on this over time anyway, in trying to um, uh, get the power system you know, up and running the way it needs to globally, the extra cost of making it you know, greener may be something we can manage politically better in this other, in this other way. Um, Mike, I've got two questions. One is, at some point in your talk, you said it may be time to uh, start all over. And I think you were referring there to the imbalance of you know, the emissions coming from a very privileged few compared with others in the world. And um, one of the problems we're having engaging um, the developing countries in this debate, and we have to bring them in, as you said at the end there, Mike. Um, one approach that I don't see talked about a lot is um, creating equity on the consumption side. For example, we import a lot of our products now from the developing countries, and we've essentially exported uh, our emissions mm -hmm. to those other countries. Outsourced so, our carbon, yeah. <clears throat> changing the accounting to taking this supply chain um, w would be one mechanism that I don't mm -hmm. see much talk about. And the other comment is one that um, it's about the economics and the cost effectiveness of renewable energy. Mm -hmm. It is cost effective if you push it out long enough, the return on investment, it just takes too long to pay it back. But mm -hmm. as the fossil fuels are bound to go up over time, it is a pretty safe bet that mm -hmm. investments now in the short term mm -hmm. will ultimately result in long-term uh, profit. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the argument that I think is a tough one to sell but needs to be um, addressed. Okay, thank you. Several good questions. On the very first point, I'll just clarify. I wasn't referring to the international 
cooperation and equity part, though I think that's very important. The restart or the reset we had to do more with how we're managing our energy system in the United States and the need to take a fresh look at it, and eventually to do that you know, globally. Now, on the rest of your points, you know, very quickly, for lack of time, um, I think that we still have a basic problem in making renewable energy cost-effective from a market point of view, as opposed to what a patient capital might tolerate. And that is not something we can work around, because there's not enough government money to be able to buy down that rate of return. What we hope is that renewables will improve through both learning by doing and research, and they will become cost-effective, but they're not now. And uh, I don't think fossil fuel depletion will help, because there's too many hundreds of years of coal available that even if oil becomes scarce, we can turn coal into oil at terrible price in terms of carbon. And I don't think we're going to get a scarcity push that will help us on this, unfortunately. Um, as far as the, the carbon trading part goes, the trade in carbon as opposed to carbon trading, there's a lot of effort being made now to look at those numbers. We could decide that we wanted to have a carbon tax on all of the carbon embedded in products as well as our direct emissions. That would involve taking on an even larger burden and might make even more um, severe the perception of you know, imbalance in what we're doing, competitiveness concerns in individual industries. Uh, it's, it's a worthwhile thing to communicate about, and it could become a worthwhile basis for policy. The opposite is putting taxes on you know, imports of Chinese products because they're not controlling their carbon. There's also some serious side effect problems with that. Ultimately, getting everybody in the game of managing emissions is the best way to go. And that's where I think, again, we need to think of some new ideas for how to do that. So your ideas are not, you know, not bad at all, but I think we need to keep trying to work on getting global cooperation before we try to you know, engineer some of these other solutions. Thank you.